wife thinks I'm my wife thinks that I'm giving up on my style. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's what Kiara says about me. I just went shopping the other day though. <laughs> By yourself or with Kiara? Uh no, I went with Kiara. Does she still pick it out? Uh-huh. <laughs> I Gotta freaking get, love it. Uh, the Banana Republic. <clears throat> Do you remember at Utah Live or Utah Life? Goodness. Uh -huh. Um, when you got all your Abercrombie stuff. Oh yeah. Does it say we're live right now? Dude, I, don't I, I can't it tell. Says it says we're live, but um I don't see on Instagram. Do no. you see it on Instagram? No. Really um, yeah, I do not see it live. Come on. StreamYard. Why would it? I put in everything. Da, 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 coffee stream. Oh, wait. Okay, now it's working. I had to do it on my on my desktop. Boom, scaling a wholesale operation to 100K months. Is it? Yeah, working? it's, oh, it's it working. Is. That's crazy. Let's go. That's sick. <laughs> um let's get it yeah people are joining it finally works now it's supposed to be on youtube too but oh, cool. i have like three subscribers on youtube so it doesn't matter there no, do you have a youtube account yet chris no i don't i should Lever yeah because i'm doing with jerry i know exactly wait i don't even think it has my oh it does have my yeti do I sound clear? Yeah, you sound good. Dope. We're getting things figured out. Okay, so Chris, for those that are in, it looks like people are actually joining. So this is, we're, we're getting somewhere. We got some um, interesting. It's not just my mom and my wife and your <laughs> mom and your wife. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Chris is one of my best friends. This dude abandoned me and moved to Florida. I'm sorry. To start an operation with the Jerry Norton. Okay, Chris, who is Jerry Norton? What does he do? Jerry Norton is like the OG wholesale guru. So if you if you go on YouTube right now and type in Jerry Norton, very likely or or just if you type in how to wholesale he's likely going to be the first guy that pops up. So he's been in the game for, you know, 20 something years and he was teaching wholesaling when wholesaling wasn't sexy. So um, me and him partnered up here in Florida and we're, we've just been doing our thing. So obviously Jerry's like a, a big YouTube guy. Um, yeah. But like, what is his actually, what does his business model look like now? Because obviously he doesn't just wholesale now. He's a uber rich investor that freaking slings it. Yeah, and you have the honor of being his partner. But what does Jerry's business look like now? So, and I don't, I don't have the full scope of it. But um, at his core, he's still just a a monster deal doer. You know, he's doing you know three you know, $4 million specs in Puerto Rico right now. He's got, you know, two hotels in Puerto Rico that he's working on. Um, so at his core, I mean, he still is just like a monster deal doer, but I mean, it's bled into, he's huge in the education space. I know he has like a fast track with Jerry program for people who are trying to get into the wholesale space who don't have any real estate backgrounds. Um, you know, he kind of, hand holds them to their first deal and teaches them, you know, how to fish. Um, and then he's got a lot of softwares that he has that probably I would imagine are going to be his most lucrative things long-term because it's a much more scalable 
product. Isn't but, it prop wire Jerry's? Is yeah, that his? yeah, he's got prop wire, he's got flipster, um, he's got all sorts of stuff. But I know his big one is like prop wire, which is like a direct competitor to prop stream. And it's free, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good if you go try it out. If you, I mean, it's apples to apples with prop stream. Like it does all the same really? stuff, but you're not spending a hundred bucks a month. Dude, that's dope. I haven't actually played with it. I've heard it's decent, but I haven't yeah. actually played with it. So I'll need to do that. Okay. So Chris is partners with the Jerry Norton, one of the biggest YouTubers for wholesaling. Uh, but this dude, so Chris and I were hanging out all the time. We're freaking going golfing. We're trying to sling deals uh, and even rewinding further beyond that. So I joined Utah Life because of Chris because I moved to Utah and I was like, who do I need to be surrounded around? One, I want to be a producing agent and two, I want to sling some investment deals um, and the inv or the agent world was brand new to me, obviously. Yeah. And so <clears throat> I kind of found out what you were doing. And I was like, okay, I need to be around this kid. So, and you were a freaking kid. How old were you? Like 21? I think, I think when we first started chatting, I just turned 22. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like talking to this 22 year old kid. I'm like, I need to do what this guy's doing. Uh, and so Chris was in freaking St. John or something. I was trying to get a hold of the guy. Oh, and that's then, right. Yeah. Freaking. Uh, we finally got in touch and I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to go to this team. Chris and I are going to scheme somehow. I had no idea what capacity at that point. I was just like, I feel like I can mesh with this dude. And then like a year later, we're besties. So it's kind of, it's kind of funny to see how it's been like this long trajectory. Now we talk every freaking week and scheme together. So, uh, so yeah, we were chilling, golfing, hanging out. And then Chris is like, yo, I'm moving to Florida. So freaking go, start from square zero on how you got that call and then how long it took you to get up and running. Because obviously you have to find a spot. You got to find, you got to get your systems up and running. Just walk us through the first like two months. Yeah. So the opportunity kind of just fell in my lap. I was a pretty high producing agent before that. And I experienced in the creative finance world and the wholesale space. And I've had a relationship with Jerry for a while now. Um, and he just messaged me about a potential collaboration of me doing, you know, a wholesale franchise with him somewhere. And the problem was, is that there were no, there's no space to do another Joe Homebuyer franchise in Utah because we already have a few. Um, so it kind of led me down a rabbit hole of like, where would I want to go? And, you know, my first inclination was ideally, I'd rather go back to Arizona, you know, where I'm from. Um, however, from a logistics standpoint, Arizona is a, I mean, just as competitive as a Utah, you know, in that space. So I, I tried to find a market where I could I could do as much damage as humanly possible for the least amount of marketing spend. At least initially, my goal is to buy a bunch of these franchises with Jerry. Um, and me and my wife had gotten married on the Florida Panhandle and we loved it. Um, and that was kind of just the, the only, only other spot that I could think of that she would want to, you know, also move because that's a big commitment for her to pick up her life, you know, and, and go somewhere. So, we, we settled on um, Panama City Beach and, you know, we're five minutes from the water and we're, we're doing our thing, at least for now. And then I mean, ideally we're going to buy a bunch of these franchises and, you know, be all over the place. But we're currently just building our systems right now. Um, I'm getting all the right people in place. It's kind of the who before the what. So I'm making sure I have all the right people in place before we do more. So your goal is just to kind of like be the boots on the ground, get these franchises up and running and then go start another one. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're doing right now. So like we've got eyes are, I would imagine our, our, the natural next territory is going to be like Mobile, Alabama and Tallahassee. Cause those are 
geographically the closest next markets and I can still utilize the same people to go take those on. They're just like, you know, an extra hour in different yeah. directions. Um, but they're still close enough that I could leverage the same team before we start, you know, pushing to, you know, potentially Jacksonville, um, you know, up through further through Alabama and some of these other markets. So did Jerry say like, okay, you can pick from this city, this city, this city, or is it just you pointing on the map and saying, let's get it? Basically, I just pointed on a map. He like he gave me free reign to kind of really? go wherever. Yeah, and it's funny. It's it's similar to how it, my very first wholesale deal I ever did was in Indianapolis, virtually. I had literally no experience uh, with wholesaling or knowing anything about indie. I just like kind of threw a dart on the map and then just started calling in that market. Um, it was the same thing with where we're at. Like the only real tie I had to this area was that me and my wife got married here and they always vacations in this part of Florida. And it's beautiful. They got like the best beaches in Florida, but I didn't know anything about the real estate. Um, so before I left, I started just like kind of testing the waters. Um, you know, while I was still in Utah, I was doing uh -huh. like virtual wholesale deals and I did like, you know, 50 grand my first month just playing around out here. And I was like, all right, there's something out here. Dude, I freaking remember that. Yeah. You were just starting to sling deals on Zillow. And I was like, what the freak is this guy doing? Yeah. Never yeah, touched. My first flip, which honestly wasn't smart in hindsight during that period. Because I knew nothing about the market. I just was extending <laughs> it. Um, but, you know, it's all a learning experience. Yeah, I'm done with flips, dude. Oh, I don't blame you. Me too. I need a break for a while. I, I know as soon as I finally like get it off my plate, I'm gonna be like, all right, I'm good to do another one. But like the like Jerry, I don't think Jerry would probably even look at a flip unless it was probably like you know 250k profit. Like, 100. It has to like the the time value of your money with doing real estate agent deals and wholesale deals is so much higher gosh yes you know like your whatever you're worth an hour is you know important to keep in mind i'm starting to realize and i've wasted so much time on this deal that i'm probably gonna you know knock on wood like get out break even 100 yeah. percent dude know. i am in a spitting image scenario as you with tomorrow and we've had this conversation several times and it's reminding us over and over like how easy it is to wholesale and represent a client not only that with like the time and the ease of it but the mind space that it freaking takes to do a flip to manage a flip and it's funny one of my first and you know now too my first real estate mentor adam lancaster I mean, he's, he's hammered this to me, you know, so many times he's like, he's a big transaction guy. He's like not in that space as much anymore. And he's like, you know, for what it's worth, like, I, I don't like, I, I like to sleep well at night and he's like, and when I'm flipping, I don't sleep good. Dude, 1 million percent and 1 like, million percent. I go through periods where I like, I forget I have it for like, you know, a few days and I'm like, I'm good. But every once in a while you'll go into those like mental spirals where you're like thinking about it. And you're like, as soon as I finish this, I'm never doing this. Again. Dude, 1 million percent. And here's the thing too, is like right now I'm on a pause with my flip because I have to go through the permitting process completely. Did yeah. I tell you that? Uh, yeah, you did. So I freaking found out I had to take down that set or the uh, addition that's encroaching on the setback. So I'm just wow. like completely starting from fresh. And even the fact that there's nothing that I can do right now, I'm just waiting for permits. I'm still stressing. So it's like, why the freak did that's I fun. sign up for this to make gosh? Well, dude, crazy. mine's have gotten even more costly to the fact where like mine's on the market right now. And we don't, our, our market's very, I mean, every market's, you got their own components and some are more seasonal than others. Ours is really seasonal because we've got a huge tourism um, in these warmer months. And my flip is in a market that um, 
you know, it's basically 90% of its population during the year is its, you know, tourism population. The rest of the year, the population is like 5,000 people. Really? So I'm sitting on the market right now, like just waiting for these tourists to come in town to buy, you know, their vacation. And so <laughs> I've actually started the refinance process. And I think it's one thing I could say I did right was before I ever did a flip, I made sure I was bankable. I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I just look at it from the perspective of like the most important thing for me is to keep my reputation and keep my reputation with my lender. You yeah. know, if something does go sideways now, like I probably would have had enough cash, you know, to you know, use a DSCR lender and I could figure it out. But like, my number one priority was just to pay back my lender to build that, you know, rapport with them and, you know, get them excited about investing in better deals than this one. A hundred percent. See, that's, I'm just going to lose my own cash. So yeah. I understand your perspective, but dude, I am also being reminded, and this is what pisses me off. Back in the day when we were first talking, I was helping you out with a lot of different things and you were helping me out with a lot of different things, almost on yeah. opposite spectrum. Uh -huh. Oh, Cause, that. Cause I had my W2, I had my like long-term rentals that were like peace of mind, blah, blah, blah. And I was always chirping at you like, dude, being bankable, like you don't understand like the hacks of being bankable. So good. this long-term financing. And here I am, I already forgot that. And you're telling me the same freaking well, dude, thing. It took me three years. I mean, really, I mean, when did I start? When did I become an agent? That would have been, it realistically took me like, you know, two and a half years of like, you know, showing money on, on my taxes, you know, to get to that point. Um, I, I mean, I wish, I, that's why I, like I'll refinance and I bet I'm going to be at like an 80% loan to value. It's like, I I'm going to have equity in it. That's not my concern. It's just like, um, I also learned a lot about opportunity cost because like showing what doing this franchise, like, dude, I've seen some good deals. We wholesale. I was under contract for a house for 17 grand. You freaking told me that. That's insane. Yeah, we, we made a $48,000 fee on that deal. And if I would have bought that one, I, I would have made 150 grand and it would have been super conservative. My cost basis, I would have been all in at 117 grand purchase and rehab. Dude, that's this one, my cost basis is all in at 400. There's a big difference between holding a, you know, having a $3,100 a month mortgage versus having an $800 a month mortgage. You know, one's going to cash yeah. flow. One's not, you know, if you have to keep it. But Dude, no profit. Yeah. 1 million percent. And this is what I'll say too, is there is a night and day difference of me trying to find a flip versus you trying to find a flip. I don't have any marketing spend right now. There's very, very slim pickings for a flip on a cash deal on the MLS or anywhere or wholesalers, slim pickings everywhere. You, on the other hand, are spending... 10, 20 grand, 30 grand, whatever it is a month on marketing. And you're going to have a lot more different opportunities for me. So getting antsy to do a flip in my shoes makes almost zero sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. Well, I would say it's actually more so for me. It's even, it makes zero sense for me to be antsy because I've got, I've got way better deal flow, you know, like for somebody who doesn't have, deal flow, they don't have as much abundance in their mindset when it comes to finding a good deal because they come across good deals less frequent. But I bought that flip before I had this deal flow. Yeah, for sure. So it, it's taught me a lot about opportunity costs. And, you know, before you go sink, you know, and in a few hundred grand of investors money into a deal, you know, make sure, you know, this is you establish a criteria of how much you want to make on deals. It's also taught me a lot about being a lot more diligent on the deals that I buy, you know, checking off certain things that, you know, do make a huge difference in profit. Like I had to do a roof. I had to build an addition. I had to do a main sewer line, um, foundation repair. 
all yeah. stuff I didn't even really check on because I bought it, you know, sight unseen, virtually, like like that. But on the on the other side of that coin too, like to me, the due diligence checklist, like for a flip, feels like it's fifty pages long. Like if you don't know construction, like the back of your hand, yeah. and you can't look at the electrical situation, the plumbing situation, the foundation, the roof, this that then it's going to be really hard to get accurate numbers. And if you have a ton of leeway on a deal, it makes more sense. But if if it's like, okay, this barely hits my numbers, like let's get it. And then, okay, you got to rewire the whole place because you didn't realize that the panel needs to be swapped out and blah, blah, blah. Like, Yeah, and that's kind of where I was on this one. I had so much spread, but a lot of it's been a up. Uh, because of lack of diligence yeah for sure so um i'm i'm just gonna stick to wholesale and you know um i'll still continue to do realty deals here and there in utah and i'll i've i'm probably just gonna be referring out most of the realty stuff we get in out here but yeah um yeah i i've definitely enjoyed wholesaling more so than flipping for sure Okay, well, I'm not going to take too much more of your time, but one other question. How long has your operation been up and running now with Joe Homebuyer? We officially started like September 7th. Okay, so right. September 7th, what is that? Like six months or less? Less than that, yeah. And November, um, January, February, like five ish months. The first month, like we weren't really like spending anything. So even that, like less than six months and you're up to a hundred K months, which is like absolutely yeah. wild. We did 150 in December. That was an awesome month. Dude, that's freaking wild. So what do you feel like led to your, is there a specific marketing uh, campaign that's done better or no, there- it's what it, what it is realistically. Um, Cause our marketing has been hitting. You know, we've been doing really well in terms of lead flow. We're getting about a hundred and like 120, 130 inbound leads a month with no mm-hmm. outbound prospecting. What's been a game changer for us is JV relationships where we're selling other people's deals and knowing creative. Still, like half of our monthly board is creative deals, which are were deals that you know three other wholesalers threw out. And we were able to restructure it in a way that made sense. Um, So we're doing a shit ton of sub two, a lot of seller finance, uh, contract for deed. Um, We've got three novations right now. Really? Listed on the market, stuff like that. So it, it really is just having every tool in your tool belt to capitalize on every lead attaching a dollar to each you know lead that you bring in now the the big thing i'll say is that like what's also really important is cash conversion cycle so from the time you spend money on marketing to the time you realize that deal has income and you know a standard cash wholesale deal is always going to be the fastest turnaround but when we can't make that work is when we start using using the other the other strategies so explain that further on the the, the lead convert or, or cash conversion. Oh yeah, cash conversion cycle is it's basically if I spend a dollar, how long is it gonna take for that dollar to turn into three dollars? You know, with you know that that marketing being realized, you know, turning into a deal. So um when you do a standard cash deal, a lot of times that's gonna be the fastest turnaround on a cash conversion cycle. If we have to take it down and list it on the MLS, that's a little longer. We might like make innovation, it longer, but like it might take a little bit longer to, to turn that into a dollar. Now, the reason it's important is because my guys are commission only, you know? So sometimes there are deals that like we would definitely make more taking down, but we still wholesale it because, you know, we need active income too. For uh, sure. And we, we still have to pay that marketing bill every month that comes in. So it's taught me a lot about just manage, managing budgets, managing a team and their expectations, stuff like that. 
So on the cash conversion cycle, you're you're talking about different types of transactions when you're comparing that. Do you use that cash conversion cycle also on a marketing stance? Because if like a PPC lead of a like I want to buy or I want to sell now fast, mm-hmm. that conversion is probably a lot faster than a cold call lead who's like, hey, I might be ready in three months. Like, yeah, and and we're not and we're not even really like outbound cold calling. I guess what I'm saying is if I'm going to spend a dollar on marketing, any marketing, you know, how fast do I get that dollar back? Typically the fastest strategy to get that dollar back is a whole, like a standard cash wholesale deal, cash buyer can close quick, you know, commit fast. You know, if you're doing a sub two deal, those are typically like a month you know, they have to do, sometimes you need reinstatements and stuff like that. So from what I guess what I'm saying is I, the marketing source doesn't necessarily matter. It's, you know, the kind of deal that you're doing. If you're doing a flip, you know, that's your longest cash conversion cycle, six months, you know, to get a return, you know, depending on if you have permits, how much work you're doing to get a return on that dollar you spent for marketing on that lead. So that's something that I've learned. I need to be very cognizant of is how quickly are we recouping, recouping our marketing cost? Dude, I've never thought about that. That's kind of wild. So with that being said, how, and you might be too early in the, in this operation side of it, but how fast are you looking at a marketing channel? Cause if you're running a PPC campaign and it's not doing so hot, like, are you, are you letting that run for three months? Or are you six. doing six, six months? months? Well, I've been fortunate so far and knock on wood that both the channels that I've have up actively have been ripping and what channels are those so we we've we do uh, pay-per-click and we do direct mail and cold calling so the direct mail and cold calling is like a turnkey company so uh-huh. we they basically pull super niche lists for us and then we mail and call to the same list so they'll get our mailers and they'll get a phone call from us Dude, I love that because I was just talking about this in one of our meetings yesterday with the team. Touch points are so crucial. Like, in whether it's realty, whether it's wholesaling, sales in general, it's the same concept for sure. Our like our struggle realistically right now, and I'm trying to find as a leader uh, a better way to implement a more concrete system. And part of it is as I just need to you know, another acquisitions manager is, um, not just taking the low hanging fruit, you know, staying on these leads till they die. Essentially we we haven't done a great job with that managing our tasks, following up. It's the exact same concept as, you know, being an agent, you've got to, I mean, a lot of times they say like it, with the average lead, it's, I think they say it's like 13 touches before. Yeah, in. exactly. And our hard thing is maybe we're at like four, but like a lot of times it's not even that, you know, so how, that- how are you organizing those touch points? Obviously you're not counting them all, but how are you organizing your leads? Do you have a CRM that yeah, we, like- use, we use Salesforce. So we, we, we have the, we have all the software in place to manage these leads. Um, I think it's a a discipline thing. And on my end, it's making sure, you know, I hold myself accountable to making sure that I keep everybody on their standards. For sure. And that's something that I could work on is that I haven't been super good at being consistent with having team standards. So inherently it's going to be difficult for them to, to stay on these, you know, weak standards. Yeah. Well, that's the thing too. Like you, you scaled the two employees or three, two full-time, one part-time, right? Yeah. In less than six months and developing systems is, is obviously insanely important for myself. Just having a freaking assistant, just having one employee that I'm with 24 seven, Yeah. even finding like rule, not even like rules, but like, okay, how are we going to organize the CRM? How are we going to ensure that every day it's clean? Like, Oh, for sure. And that's, that's the toughest part. It's like, you know, uh, I'm reading good to great right now. And he talks about, you know, who first and then what, like you got to get the people on the train 
And then you kind of figure out afterwards. So that's kind of the philosophy that I've been following is like, I don't exactly know yet what's the most optimized way to do something. I just know I need people. So I've been actively and I'm actively searching right now for another acquisition manager because um, it's very inefficient for, you know, one guy to be managing all these leads. It's, it's impossible. It's like, you know, the equivalent really is like, imagine if, you know, 50% of the Perry groups, the leads were just going to you. Yeah. It's yeah. Like insane. It's You're not going to, you can't keep up with that yeah, yeah. without people and systems. So that's what it is right now for him. And he's been doing great. Um, I'm just focusing on getting more, more people. Yeah, dude. So I'll, I'll say this too is for people trying to figure out how to wholesale running a full operation is it seems like years out or whatever. Like it seems like unreachable, but for what you did your first year and what I've done this year and doing these single handedly single handed deals. Yeah. There's such a market for that. And just as like a background of that, uh, a lot of what Chris and I have done is find deals on the market, negotiate those deals. Usually seller finance, those are what are the easiest to hit right now. Mm-hmm. And then finding buyers, you can do it on market. But with that concept, Chris, like if someone's, if someone's not doing deals right now or not doing any wholesale deals right now, and this whole operation thing is over their head, but they're trying to do a few deals a year, what would you say they should be doing? Learn creative. hundred percent. I mean, I did, I've done on market cash deals. You can totally do it, but you could go make a hundred grand in 90 days. If you plug in, you call low equity, you call high equity and you pitch sub two and seller finance. A hundred percent. Huge demand for it. Especially if you had a deal in Utah gone like that. Yeah. There's different dynamics in markets too. I've got a, there's a look, there's not as high of an investor appetite where I'm at in Florida. Easier to find deals, harder to sell deals, vice versa in Utah, harder to find deals, easier to sell. So if you find a good seller finance deal in Utah or a good sub two deal, that thing is gone. For sure. Here's another side of that coin. Okay. Cause the amount of people that come to me and come to you, the same exact route is okay can we go to lunch i'd love to pick your brain how to learn creative finance it's impossible to teach someone creative finance to the point where they can do transactions even even in a full like even in a four-hour lunch let's say we go to freaking tacanos and we're talking for four hours like it's impossible and for me my my journey was a lot different than yours where i paid for education yeah, I paid for different mentors that I knew in the space could teach me creative. Yours was different, right? Like you started, tell us a little bit more about your journey, how you actually learned creative. A lot of it was trial by fire. You know, like, I mean, I, I was in sub two. I've been in, I was probably one of the first people in Utah in sub two. At least I knew. I mean, Jeremy Davis was like the OG, but I mean, I've been in sub two for like three years, but I didn't use it. Like, that's the problem. Like, I was in it. I never used it. Yeah. That's how and I finally, am. you know, when the market shifted, rates went up. I was like, I need, a, I know I need to learn this. Like, I know I need to get a hold of this. And, but I was thinking of it from like a retail perspective. So, like, my first like real seller finance deal was actually a listing. Um, I had a $1.3 million townhouse in uh just outside of park city in hideout and it where we were priced because he he bought it the year prior for a million fifty and he didn't want it he he was like he's a real estate investor he didn't have any need for the cash um so i wanted to make a profit for him Mm -hmm. um and we sold it for one, three, five, a year later in a rising rate environment on seller finance. Goodness. And that was my first like glimpse of like, Oh shit. Like this like makes sense. Um, we sold it to Alec Burbage. 
that you've sold a lot of deals to Alec Burbage, haven't you? Yeah. And, you know, so he made, you know, 350 grand, not including, you know, the 4% interest only note that we're financing it on, you know, over a seven year balloon, which we did, like my seller will make 700 grand on that deal. Did he own it free and clear? Um, he did. He bought it cash the year before. He did a 1031 into it, bought it cash, basically made 350 grand in a year on his purchase price. Good. And then another 350 he'll make in interest over seven years. So that that right there like showed me the power because it was also we structured it so the payment was low enough on an interest only note where Alec could cash flow on a new construction townhouse in Park City. That's wild. That's freaking wild. He only put, I think, 10% down on that deal. And that was the like my first real glimpse of like, oh, this is super powerful. Like you can make a win-win where both people are super happy. Like my seller is stoked. Alec was stoked. And you know, I made my three percent on that deal. You know, I mean 30 grand selling that townhouse and I helped him buy it the year before. So I made sixty thousand dollars off that client in you know a year. And he was I, happy <laughs> when I first signed that deal. I didn't think I was going to be able to sell it. Like I, I listed it at one three five on the MLS, and I had no traction for ninety days. I had like two showings, and I changed one thing in the description. It was will accept seller financing, and it flew. Gosh, so your tactic of learning seller finance is be involved in an atmosphere that you're actually doing deals, whether it's retail, just doing real estate deals learning the the ropes and yeah you've got you've got to have a combination of a commitment to education but not not so much where you're you've got that analysis paralysis so like you've got to want to learn it but like i've always been like oh i'm gonna learn that real quick and then i'm gonna go try it like that's how i got into wholesaling like i'd watch a bunch of youtube videos and then i go try it um so i think it's it's a combination of not just diving down that like education well but then like not doing anything with it like, so many people do that like you just need to go like learn it try it learn it try it oh that didn't work let me try this you know i think that's it's imperfect action 100 percent, dude the amount of people that i witness that will fanboy these communities they'll fanboy these facebook forums but they're not actually doing any action, that's a recipe for disaster because what the heck? Did I just do that? I think I did it. <laughs> but that like that's such a bad well to be in. Like you could get stuck in because it feels good learning. It feels good being in that community. Yeah, you feel like you're doing something when yeah. in theory, you know, like you are learning, which is great, but like people just stay there. They just like, well, they'll listen to hundreds of bigger pockets episodes. Uh, they'll watch all the YouTube videos, but they won't pick up the phone. Yeah. You know, that's definitely step one, but like you're going to be stuck in step one for years. If you, you know. don't take, you have to be okay messing up. Like the amount of times that me and you have had some oh, L's, yeah. like my I L's are probably a lot fatter than your <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, your, your property in, in Salt Lake was a great learning lesson for both of us. Like I learned a lot from watching you go through that deal. So it's that also is something to be said about like who you surround yourself with matters. Not saying that I was taking advantage of your L, but like, it was something that like, I'm like, Oh, like, I didn't know that was a thing. That's something I should probably check on in the future. A hundred percent. Well, not even, it's not taking advantage, but like if you're surrounded by people that are actually taking action, you're going to learn. Like, yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Like I, I doubt hardly anybody knows about what you went through and that that was even possible. Yeah. In the sub two, like I had no idea somebody could put that into the loan documents that something couldn't be resold. A hundred percent. So for those, I'm going to, record this and put it on youtube too so for those of you that don't know what we're talking about i had a sub two deal in salt lake that i converted to a top bottom where i lost 175 180 grand on 
and I could not. People always say, well, did you transfer it to a, a lease option, a contract for deed? We tried that. We tried, we could not sell this property. We could not live in this property because there's a deed restriction by a low income entity called NeighborWorks, which is similar to Utah housing that would not let me do a single thing. So well, and they had that provision in it where they could like inspect the property annually. Um, I, looking back in hindsight, what I know now, I do think if we would have started with contract for deed, hundred percent, you could have fixed it. Yeah. Because the seller would have remained, you know, on title, you would have an, an interest in the property and you would just have to hold it for what was it? 10 years. They had a deed restriction on it for or something. 10 years from when they bought it. So there was like seven years left. Yeah. So you would have had to hold it on a contract for deed for a minimum of, of seven years. But we didn't know that at the time. Exactly. You know, and we didn't know how to approach that issue. So, um, but now if something like that happens, you know what you can do. That's another good point of being bankable. 100%. And a few lessons that I learned on that is number one, don't trust a soul who is selling you a deal. That's number one. Number two, read through your freaking contracts, especially with creative finance. There is a, it is not cut dry. Like every single deal is going to be different. And number three, don't dive into a deal that you're not confident in. Like, yeah, I, I have told myself and I have made these high risk, high reward excuses or like, if you don't fail, you're not going to learn, but you can have a lot more calculated risks and come out a whole lot better than I have. So I'm done with that excuse of like, it's an expensive learning lesson because Chris, you and I are both like knowledgeable enough to avoid dumb situations like that. Even if I had a title company that represented me, that was my title company, I would have been saved. So even, even that, like throwing that into the mix, like having a title company that one you trust and two that has your best interest goes a long way. Yeah, it really does. That, that was the clearest example for me of like, I do need to be more diligent and going into some of these deals. Cause I would have bought that deal too all day long. If I had how much cash you had at that time, I would have bought that deal. Like it made a great area, great neighborhood built in 2014, like all day long, I would have bought that deal. Um, and when you got it up and running, it was performing very um, well. Yeah. That's the, that's the hard thing is like everything made sense other than that, that little, a little thing. Dude, the worst part was my tenant sent me, the notice of what do they call that notice of it's not notice of default, but it was like going to the auction, like the letter. Yeah, yeah, it was the, yeah, it would have been a notice of default or notice of foreclosure or something. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Cause like it was, it was defaulted for over a year. So it wasn't yeah. like, and supposedly the title company said we paid back the rears, but anyways, well, lesson learned. You live and you learn. Well, let's um, let's end on a, a note of where can people find you? Where uh, where can they help you out in your business? Um, you can just find me on Instagram, Chris Allen Real Estate, and I'm always looking for deals. You know, we sell deals nationwide too. I mean, I've got a deal in Colorado, I've got a deal in Meridian, Mississippi, I've got another one in Pennsylvania, I've got two in Texas right now um that we're selling so if you got a deal send it send it my way we we can dispo nationwide so um hopefully we can both make some money love it okay thanks homie for jumping on we'll have to do this more sweet dude we'll we'll chat soon stay in touch i'm visiting you in florida still let's do it okay peace out brother see ya